Hello friends, welcome to our channel. Today we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. The case of Cassandra Cantrell. Fear is a negative and unpleasant feeling. Would anyone want to experience it over and over again? Cassandra Cantrell and her twin brother Rob were the exception. As young children, they couldn't go a day without the scary stories they liked to tell each other in a room with the lights off. Rob was a natural storyteller, or at least he thought he was. Cassandra would scream at every story he told, and he, playing the brave though small man, would sprawl on his bed. They also watched the animated series Scooby-Doo together, and while watching it, they argued over which of the characters in the story would turn out to be a ghost or a vampire in disguise. Cassandra's intuitive guesses were often ahead of her brother, and then he was nervous. Their mother, Mary Smith, although she did not share the same passion as the twins, bought them books by Robert Wall to instill a love of reading in her children. A love for scary stories was not just a childhood hobby, but a lifelong passion that the brother and sister shared. They even collected figurines of villains, and as adults, seriously considered opening a themed store associated with this culture of horror. An interest in horror movies brought Cassandra to the set in 2004, where she got a cameo in a scary movie that, although it didn't become popular, still caused a storm of envy in Rob, and he started asking his sister to make a deal for him. Rob was very happy, but to play, albeit in an episodic role, he was not able to. The head of the cast in that movie was Colin Dudley, and on the set, between him and debuting actress Cassandra, flashed a spark. To make the first step, each of them did not dare, but that all changed during a corporate Halloween party. Cassandra dressed up as Velma from Scooby-Doo, and Colin dressed up as Alex from A Clockwork Orange. For Cassandra, the image of the cartoon character was just an image. But for Colin Dudley, it seemed to be something more. He walked around with a glass of milk all evening, looking at everyone with a glare just as his character did in the movie. And he also talked a lot of quotes from the book. For example, looking at Cassandra with delight, he said, Beauty invariably caused my only desire to destroy it, for it did not fit at all into our ugly world. Cassandra thought it was a compliment, and they soon began dating, but their relationship didn't last long. Only a couple of months later, Colin found another actress, Rebecca, and started dating her, and later the couple started living together. On August 25, 2020, Cassandra Cantrell disappeared. She, without warning anyone, drove her car away from home in an unknown direction and did not answer phone calls. The police officers were very reluctant to take a report from her mother for a very long time, trying to calm the poor woman down and saying that sometimes children grow up and don't always warn their parents when they go out with friends. But Mary Smith was sure that something terrible had happened and maybe if the lazy cops would finally start working, she would still have a chance to see her daughter alive. The search for Cassandra did not begin until two days later, and on the third day, the police found her car under a bridge, not in the most favorable area. Also, to add to the bad news, the car was unlocked and the keys were inside. It was impossible to understand what Cassandra was doing here. This place was considered a neighborhood of homeless people where, with frequent frequency, the police found their bodies killed in a domestic fight or died of an overdose of illegal drugs. The officers had to go around the neighborhood questioning a lot of homeless people who, at the sight of the police, tried to get away for a while. But it was all to no avail. None of them had seen Cassandra, and none of them knew when the car showed up there. It was hard to expect anything else from the residents who lived under the bridge and drank alcohol all day long. The detective involved in the search for Cassandra had requested her cell phone billing, as he was instructed to do, but from experience, he was sure it would get him nowhere, and so it did. The signal showed that the phone was in the nearest body of water to the bridge, which meant that the detectives would not be able to recover it and get the information they needed. Nevertheless, a team of divers began searching the coastal area, and before they did so, standing on the shore, they picked up rocks from the ground and threw them into the water, 
testing how far they could throw the phone. Cassandra's mother said that her missing daughter's phone case was decorated with rhinestones, which meant it would not be difficult to find. Indeed, the phone was soon found, but Cassandra's body was not in the water. This things was presented to her mother as good news, but the poor woman did not feel any better. She seemed to have gotten used to the idea that her daughter was dead. And the only thing she wanted was for her body to be found and for this nightmare of uncertainty to end. Cassandra, as it seemed to her mother, despite her already realized age, was not married and did not even meet anyone. It was understandable that she had gotten pregnant by a man, but Mary had no information about the father of the child. Although, again from the words of her mother, her daughter very often corresponded with someone and called, but the phone number of her interlocutor, for some reason, was not recorded in the daughter's book, and the mother, of course, did not remember the numbers. She just noticed that it is quite strange to communicate so often with a person and not write down his number. Cassandra could not keep their relationships in absolute secrecy, and there should be at least one friend with whom Cassandra shared her secrets, and especially if those secrets were related to pregnancy. Such a friend was found, and in a conversation with police officers, she revealed that Cassandra had rekindled her relationship with her former boyfriend, Colin Dudley. Yes, their past relationship in 2004 was short-lived, and besides, it's been 15 years since their breakup. It is strange in general that after so much time, they remembered each other. As it turned out, Colin himself came out to Cassandra, with whom he once worked on a movie set in 2014. He found Cassandra on Facebook, wrote some warm words, and confessed that just recently his father died, with whom his wife, Rebecca, had a difficult relationship, and so he had no one to share his grief with. Cassandra, purely because of friendly motives, decided to meet and talk to the ex-boyfriend to calm him down, but the friendly meeting turned into something more. Since 2014, Colin began to live literally on two families, where Cassandra was in the status of mistress. When the young woman found out that she was pregnant, she did not want to inform Colin Dudley because every time she wanted to admit it to him, she recalled their conversation where Colin said that he absolutely did not want children and that he was very happy about Rebecca being infertile. The news that he might have a daughter or son could destroy a real family and Cassandra didn't want to hurt her lover, so she kept the news a secret. Meanwhile, her belly was growing and it was impossible to hide it under the oversized sweaters. And in order for Colin not to guess anything, Cassandra stopped seeing him. But she couldn't hide it for long. And if she lied about having another boyfriend, it would hurt Colin and cause them to break up. Cassandra decided that the bitter truth was better than a sweet lie. So she told Colin over the phone that she was expecting a child with him. Colin was silent for a while, and then he finally said that he was delighted to hear the news. It sounded very strange, but Cassandra concluded that Colin was genuinely pleased. The detective arrived at Colin's house, knocked on the door, and his wife opened it, deciding that it wasn't quite ethical to talk about a missing mistress in the presence of Colin's legal wife. The detective introduced himself as an old friend of Dudley's. Colin came out immediately, shut the door behind him, and walked away from the house with the detective, though the latter hadn't even introduced himself yet. It was as if he had been waiting for this meeting. Thank you for not making your credentials public in front of Rebecca. You're a man of honor, a true officer. My compliments to you, Colin spoke in short sentences. I heard Cassandra is missing. It's weird, bloody weird. I can't even guess where. She might have gone, she told me she'd had a big fight with her brother and was really worried about it. I advised her to stop by and make up with him. I don't know if she listened to me or not. That Cassandra and Rob had been in a fight, the detective knew. Rob had told him about it himself. It was nothing serious, just a family misunderstanding. But nevertheless, Cassandra's twin brother had been very upset about it because the day she disappeared, Cassandra had called him and wanted to come and talk to him, but his proud brother had refused, and now he blamed himself for it. 
If his sister had come to see him that day, she wouldn't have disappeared. You know, officer, I'm not the nicest person. I think you realize that. Dating my ex-girlfriend in secret from my wife and for such a long period of time. I'm sure I'll be punished for it in the next world, but the human heart doesn't decide who you fall in love with. In 2014, my father died. He literally hated Rebecca with all his soul, and the feeling was mutual, but he really liked Cassandra. He often remembered her, reproached me for the fact that we broke up with her almost immediately after Christmas. We often fight with our parents, accusing them of not understanding, and then it turns out that it's us, their children, who don't understand, and it hurts. My father was right, of course, and after he died I just wanted to fulfill one of his wishes, and so I resumed my relationship with Cassandra. Rebecca needed to be broken up with. It was a conversation I kept putting off, you know. This family stuff sucks you dry, so I kept stalling. I've been living a double life for five years. It was hell. I had to make excuses for coming home late all the time to hide it. I'd tell her about some fictitious business trips and even bought a fishing rod, even though I hated fishing, a stupid pastime. And I'd tell Rebecca I was going to the lake while I went to Cassandra's before coming home. I'd buy fish at the supermarket for extra convincing, and Rebecca would bake it in the oven, and I'd eat it, even though the smell of fish makes me sick. The detective said, Did you know Cassandra was pregnant? Dudley replied in surprise, Pregnant by whom? The detective then explained, I don't have that information, but she told a close friend of hers that it was from you. Dudley affirmed that, that can't be true. She's been adamantly refusing to see him lately, and he guess he understand her and can't blame her for that. Naturally, she was tired of being in the background and wanted a family, which unfortunately he couldn't give her. He guessed that the reason she refused to see him was because she had found someone else. The detective asked Colin when he last saw Cassandra. Colin claimed that the last time he saw her was about three or four months ago. This was not Colin's last encounter with the detective. Even though Cassandra's phone, which was lifted from the bottom of the pond and could not be recovered, the police requested the details of the calls of the missing person, and it turned out that most likely the unsigned number about which her mother told her belongs to Colin Dudley. Most often, Cassandra called him and even on the day of her disappearance, they called each other. In addition, on that day, the police received CCTV footage from the train station near the bridge where Cassandra's abandoned car had been found. And on it, they saw a strange man who stood out in the crowd of passengers on the platform. He wore a long cloak, gloves, his face was hidden in a scarf and a hat was placed on his head, the sides of which covered his eyes. It was impossible to make out the face, but the detective said that the man's gait reminded him very much of Colin Dudley. As for the hat, it was almost identical to the one worn by Alex from A Clockwork Orange. After continuing to follow the strange man through the CCTV cameras, the detectives noticed that he literally went into the cafe for a few minutes, then came out of there and went towards the parking lot where he got into his car and drove away. During all this time, the stranger never showed his face, but they could see the license plate number of the car in which the stranger got into, and the car belonged to Colin Dudley. A unit was sent to his house with a search warrant. The detectives had initially believed that Cassandra was alive and in the basement of Dudley's house. At first, there was no evidence of a murder at Colin's house. However, in the closet, they found the very hat that Colin was trying to cover himself with. They then went down to the basement, but Cassandra was not there, nor was there any evidence of the crime. However, the service dog, trained to search by the scent of blood, barked as it sniffed the couch, which was already a very alarming sign. Colin assured the police that he had done nothing illegal and that they simply had no evidence and no other suspects, so they were trying to pin the crime on him, an innocent man. The detective interviewed his wife, who was shocked at what was going on in their home, the accusations against her husband, and the fact that she had been deceived for years. When the detective asked her if her husband was capable of murder, 
She answered in the negative after thinking about it for a long time. The evidence found against Colin was not enough to put him in jail, which made Rob and Mary Smith very angry. The detective was just throwing up his hands. Colin was called in for questioning again, and he thought carefully about the crime, as he had an alibi for all the allegations on the morning of August 25th at 6.30 a.m. Colin visited a hardware store where he purchased household cleaning chemicals and trash bags, and the store's cameras confirmed this. However, the large trash bags overshadowed this situation. Colin then received a text message from Cassandra that she was almost at his house, but he immediately deleted the message. But it remained in the cell phone carrier's memory, and the police got it from the call and message dump. Also, according to their cell phone billing, the couple did not leave the house that morning for several hours. Colin then turned off his phone but left his mistress's phone on, most likely by accident, and the police saw the entire path of his movements, including where he was seen on the station's CCTV cameras. As the police already knew, after the cafe where he was probably recovering from the murder by washing up in the toilet, Colin got into his car and drove to the pond where he had dumped Cassandra's phone, where the last signal from the cell phone had been received. It was now necessary to search for Cassandra's body, and the police, in order to accurately track the route, seized a GPS tracker from Colin's car. The device completely replicated the movement of Cassandra's cell phone signal, but there was new evidence in the case based on his movements. The next day, the cops retraced his path that went through the woods, and there, in a ravine, they spotted a huge trash can tied with ropes. All the ground around it was covered in blood, and it became clear what was in the container. By then, it had been a month since the murder, and identifying the body was difficult. The police were helped by Cassandra's tattoo, which was described in the search notes. Colin was apprehended the same day and charged with murder. Forensics conducted a forensic examination and indicated that death was caused by a fractured skull due to blunt force trauma. During the examination of the basement of the Dudley house, the police found traces of blood that could not be completely cleaned. Rebecca knew nothing about the murder as she spent all day in another part of the house from which no noise in the basement could be heard. She also confirmed that Colin never wanted children and his story about her infertility was just a fiction, which the police took as a motive for the crime. During the trial, due to the lack of witnesses and physical evidence, such as the murder weapon, it was impossible to convince the jury that the murder was committed by Colin Dudley. Then the court made a deal with the killer that if he pleaded guilty, he would get a lesser sentence. Colin was sentenced to 26 years in prison Cassandra's mother and her brother, who still felt guilty that he had not agreed to meet with his sister before her death, were very upset because the killer would most likely live to see the moment when he could go free. Lisa Maria Kaiza was born in 1994 in a large family where her eight siblings also grew up. It was a large but far from prosperous family. Parents were busy with their own problems and did not show love and care towards their children. Moreover, there were rumors that abuse and violence were rampant in the family. The story in question unfolded in the year 2020, at the very time when the whole world was consumed with the fight against COVID-19. In one corner of Ecuador, quietly and unnoticed, truly terrible events were unfolding. Here, in the small parish of Pifo, on the northeastern outskirts of Quito, the protagonist of this tragic story was born and raised. Lisa Maria Kaiza, a woman with an enigmatic gaze whose life story became a true Ecuadorian nightmare. On that unfortunate Tuesday, October 27, 2020, Lisa sent several messages to the father of her children, David. They were words full of despair because their paths with David at that time had already almost parted. In these lines, she confessed her love for him and her unexpected new pregnancy. However, in subsequent messages, Lissa wrote that life was losing its meaning for her, and the decision to terminate the pregnancy was inevitable. Throughout the night, Lissa pleaded with David to come to her, but his refusal was resolute. His parents also urged him to stay home, 
and David took their advice. In the early morning hours of October 28th, neighbors in Lissa's home heard a faint cry for help. Looking out the window, they found a woman lying on the floor with signs of vomiting. The neighbors rushed to help her, immediately calling emergency services. The doctors and police arrived and found Lissa in a critical condition, but still alive. After administering first aid, she was immediately hospitalized. However, in the house, her children, a girl of five and a boy of nine, were found unconscious. The doctors were unable to help them. Their little hearts had stopped beating at that point. Authorities learned the identity of the children's father and contacted David Acosta, who upon learning of the tragedy, immediately arrived on the scene accompanied by his father. He was informed that Lissa was in the hospital and his children were found without signs of life. After several days of fighting for life in the hospital, Lissa finally regained consciousness. By that time, the investigators, guided by their findings, had presented the prosecutor's office with sufficiently convincing arguments to issue an arrest warrant for this mysterious woman. When she was released from the hospital, she was immediately transferred to a social rehabilitation center. The authorities insisted that Lissa undergo a psychological and psychiatric evaluation as her state of mind required further investigation as part of the upcoming trial. Lissa ended up in a rehabilitation center and doctors and psychologists took up their work. In a conversation with a criminal psychologist, Lissa opened up about her difficult childhood where her parents fought and abused each other and their children. Her childhood had a noticeable impact on her state of mind and moments of quarrels and her parents' divorce became an integral part of her memories. Such a childhood forced Lissa to go to work from the age of 11 to be able to study. The girl strived to escape from her dysfunctional family and build her future in a different way. The expert report also indicated that Lissa had been abused. She talked about how, after several years of marriage, David, her husband, changed dramatically. He began to humiliate his spouse and then to raise his hand against her. On the day of the tragedy with the children, Investigators working at the scene found several glasses with liquid residue on the table. These finds later revealed traces of epilepsy pills belonging to one of the children, as well as other chemicals requiring identification. Police officers thoroughly searched the house, and after noticing a strange odor in the kitchen, noticed a suspicious area under the utility room. They broke down the barrier and found a lifeless body wrapped in a blanket with characteristic signs of having been there for a long time. Later, further investigation revealed that the discovered body belonged to Jaime Yanchaguano, a 28-year-old who had been in contact with Lisa. Jaime had been reported missing by his family days before the gruesome discovery. According to Rosa Yanchaguano, Jaime's sister, he was last seen on October 18th. Rosa told investigators that after her brother disappeared, Lisa called several times inquiring about him. Lisa claimed to have received a text message from Jaime, where he mentioned that illegal substance traffickers were holding him captive and demanding a ransom of $8,000. She strongly warned Jaime's family not to contact the police. This claim became a crucial point in a complex investigation, as detectives sought to solve the tragedy and uncover if there were any other hidden victims. During her interrogation, Lisa revealed that in 2020, while working at a cookie factory, she met Jaime Ian Chiguano. According to her, they became friends. Lisa wanted to return to her husband, who allegedly planned to blackmail Jaime for money. David made it clear to Lisa that if she did not help him, he would divorce her. Later, David gave Lisa a white powder and told her to put it in Jaime's food. Once she did, Jaime fell asleep and never woke up. Realizing what had happened, Lisa, in desperation, tried to win back her husband, but failed. In her despair, she ingested the same poison and gave it to her children. However, the poison did not have the expected effect on her, and she sought help from her neighbors to save herself from the horror that had befallen her children. Following her testimony, investigators launched a thorough investigation, but no evidence of David's involvement was found. No one close to the couple could have foreseen that Lisa Maria and David Acosta's lives would take such a tragic turn. When they met, Lisa was only 16 years old and still in high school, 
a dreamy and romantic girl, while David was a strong and determined young man. Their friendship quickly developed into strong feelings, leading to Lisa's unexpected pregnancy. Although their families disapproved of their relationship, David's parents supported their son and welcomed Lisa into their home. In difficult times, David's family provided genuine support to the young couple, even inviting Lisa to live with them to ensure she completed high school. When Lisa turned 18, the couple got married. Two years later, they were expecting their second child, a daughter. David's parents decided to provide the young couple with their own home, giving them an apartment where they found a corner of family happiness. However, over time, their relationship began to deteriorate. Both spouses were unfaithful, leading to mistrust and disappointment. Their once boundless love began to weaken. Lisa also complained of psychological abuse from David, prompting her to seek help from the police. Eventually, she was granted a protective order, forcing David to leave the family home. At this point, Lisa began to blackmail David, demanding money for the chance to see their children. In early September 2020, Lisa's life took an unexpected turn when her eldest son began suffering from seizures. In desperation, she took him to the emergency room at Baca Ortiz Hospital. After stabilizing his condition, doctors conducted tests and diagnosed a focal form of epilepsy, a severe condition affecting a specific part of the brain. Doctors advised Lisa to undergo further tests, including MRIs, and to consult specialists urgently. However, Lisa ignored these recommendations. A month later, her son suffered another seizure and they returned to the emergency room. Reviewing his medical history, doctors discovered Lisa had not followed their earlier advice, failed to complete tests, and had not seen specialists, leaving her son without necessary treatment. They warned her that continued neglect could lead to legal consequences. Despite the warnings, Lisa disregarded the medical advice. A few weeks later, after her son's condition resurfaced, she called David, who was alarmed by her serious tone. She informed him that a social worker would visit to discuss their son's diagnosis and treatment. On the day of the appointment, David arrived, but the social worker had already left. To brighten the waiting time, Lisa offered him a drink. However, as David drank the drink, he suddenly felt unwell. His condition was worsening and the social worker had not shown up. So David decided to go home to get something to deal with his discomfort. The next morning, David woke up in a terrible state. He could barely speak because his tongue was numb. Every step caused discomfort and his eyes hurt. His parents insisted on calling an ambulance. David was taken to the hospital where he spent several days Tests revealed the presence of a psychoactive substance in his system, but given that he hadn't used anything of the sort, David began to speculate how this could have happened. Eventually, he speculated that perhaps someone had deliberately slipped him some substance in a public place. David was grateful for his life and realized that what had happened could have ended much worse. In early October 2020, Lissa made the decision to hire a nanny for her children. Her cousin Patricia recommended her friend Bertha, a responsible 48-year-old woman looking for work. On Monday, October 5th, Bertha arrived at the young mother's house. Lissa urged her to take a pill that she said helped prevent infection with the COVID-19 virus, an epidemic of which was at its height at the time. Claiming that it was a highly effective natural remedy, Lissa convinced Bertha to swallow the medicine and enter the house. They sat down to discuss the babysitter's childcare duties. A few minutes later, Bertha began to feel sick. She felt a headache. Her stomach began to upset, and eventually she vomited. A short while later, Patricia showed up. It turned out that she had called her cousin repeatedly, but Lissa didn't answer, which alerted Patricia. She decided to check what had happened and immediately went to her house. Upon entering, she found Bertha lying on the couch, who was practically fainting already. Lissa shared with her cousin what had happened and expressed concern. Learning that Lissa still had not called an ambulance, Patricia immediately did so herself. After a while, doctors arrived and sent Berta to the hospital. The condition of the victim managed to stabilize. Doctors diagnosed poisoning with a toxic substance, which often happens when using various medications. 
Doctors decided that Bertha did not tolerate some component of the composition of the pills from COVID-19. A few months before this tragic incident, in June of the same year, Lissa's former buddy, Mark Escanto, had died of poisoning. At the time, the cause of his death had gone unnoticed. But now, given all these strange circumstances, Mark's case required additional attention. Investigators scrutinized the deceased's home and found Lissa's fingerprints on the glasses used the night before Mark's death. This fact added new evidence to the investigation, pointing to Lissa's possible involvement in the incident. But suddenly, a new accusation was made against Lissa. Her own family made a shocking report to the police. It turns out that on September 2nd, the family had a family gathering where Lissa offered to let everyone taste a drink of her own making. Seven brothers and sisters of the young woman, as well as their parents, drank the unknown drink and immediately felt sick. Fortunately, no one died, but the 56-year-old mother suffered a stroke. Lissa's father claimed that while the relatives were seeking medical attention, his daughter stole $1,300 from the house. Now the investigation included not only crimes against the children and a former boyfriend, but also an incident that jeopardized the lives and health of her own family members. As it turned out, that wasn't all. Investigators encountered another strange event. In May of that year, Jose Luis Erazo, a friend of Lissa's, was found dead in his home. A few days before, Jose had suddenly disappeared, and neighbors soon smelled a rotting odor, prompting them to contact the authorities. An examination of the body initially revealed nothing suspicious and was ruled a heart attack. But one of Jose's sisters suspected something strange and hid a bottle of alcohol found in the refrigerator. In addition, Jose's family noticed that some items were missing from the house. It turned out that Lissa and Jose were friends, and when the guy died, the alleged killer contacted his relatives by phone. With a distraught voice, she stated that Jose owed her a large sum of money, and she had to contact the family to repay the debt. This cunning plan did not work, and a little later Lissa called Jose's family again, changing her voice to conceal her identity. Identifying herself as Jose's friend, she claimed that she was pregnant by him and now had to apply for child support. Although Jose's family did not believe these stories, Lisa was not about to give up and made a third attempt to deceive them. She said she knew who was responsible for Jose's death and offered to meet to uncover the details. Had she not been arrested on charges of killing her own children in Jaime, the list of victims might have gotten longer. When the media reported the arrest of Lisa, who had poisoned three people, Jose's relatives understood. They immediately reported their suspicions to the authorities, and Jose's body was exhumed for forensic examination to determine the true cause of death. The relatives were not mistaken. Traces of poison were found in the remains of the deceased. On December 22, 2020, a hearing was held for Lisa Maria Kaiser for the murder of her two children, whose names and photos were classified, and for Jaime Yanchaguano. The trial was conducted virtually due to restrictions related to the spread of the COVID-19 virus. Lisa had been in contact from a social rehabilitation center. The prosecutor's statement said that Lisa gave her children a toxic mixture of insecticides and anti-epileptic drugs. In interrogations, she claimed that she had grown desperate and could not leave her children with her husband, David, who did not care for the children. In fact, she admitted that she wished them dead. At the end of the hearing, the judge issued the defendant a court pass and ordered her remanded into custody pending trial. The children's trial next took place in 2021 at the Pichincha Provincial Court. The prosecutor presented a set of evidence to prove Lissa's guilt. Among them were statements by David, who revealed the content of messages the wife had received on the eve of the tragedy. In one of the messages, she claimed that she would take with her what belonged to her, referring to the children. She said she didn't know where her children and herself would go, heaven or hell. But now she felt as if she was in hell. Lissa added that she doesn't expect her husband to forgive her because she knows he hated her and now he will hate her even more. David also spoke about his unstable relationship with his wife. At the hearing, the defendant's reconstructed testimony was presented, stating that she took two pills that day, called for help, and then passed out. According to the reconstruction conducted by the prosecutor's office, 
The daughter died while still in bed, and her older brother tried to take a few steps to call for help, but fell and died. The conclusion of the forensic medical examination was extremely clear. The children died as a result of a premeditated crime. The deaths were the result of suffocation caused by pulmonary edema, an intoxication caused by a mixture of epilepsy medication and other unspecified substances, presumably insecticides and disinfectant. The prosecution also charged Lissa with the death of Jamie Iancheguano, whose body was found bricked up in the kitchen. The perpetrator was also suspected of attempting to kill David and members of her own family. The hearing raised the issue of Lissa's irresponsible attitude to her son's health after being diagnosed with localized epilepsy. The mother ignored instructions for further tests and follow-up examinations, and when the boy was hospitalized again, his condition was exacerbated by her own mother's negligence. Warnings from medical professionals did not change her attitude toward her son's treatment, leading to a threatened termination of her parental rights. Lissa's mental health investigations revealed her to be highly emotional and environmentally dependent. She sought constant attention and understanding from others and experienced severe anxiety when events did not unfold according to her plan. She also exhibited a tendency to self-harm. She attempted to say goodbye to her life at least three times, but was unsuccessful each time. Witnesses described her as insecure, attachment-seeking, exhibiting schizoid and erratic behavior. The findings of the psychological analysis also emphasized that on the day of the tragic events, Lissa acted with full awareness of her actions. After a long trial that lasted 10 months, Lisa Maria Kaisa was found guilty of the crime against her children. The Pachincha Provincial Court sentenced her to 34 years and eight months imprisonment. In addition to this, she was ordered to pay David a compensation of more than $20,000. It was noted in the press that Lisa remained calm throughout the proceedings and only showed emotion when her children were mentioned. The Jaime Yangchaguano murder case, which began in August 2021, appeared to be unfinished. New details were revealed during the court hearings. Lissa admitted giving her friend a white substance mixed with alcohol, but claimed she got it from David. However, the investigation proved otherwise. According to a psychiatrist who interviewed Lissa, she did not want to take Jaime's life. She wanted to intimidate his family so she could then extort money. She did demand $8,000 as ransom, Experts called the plan disorganized, which ultimately led to the crime. In addition, forensic tests revealed that it wasn't that simple. Jaime was found to have poison in his system and the cause of death was strangulation. The body was found with a shattered ribcage and wire around the neck. Lissa claimed that after her friend died, she decided to bury him under a back room and cement him in. The store owner's testimony confirmed that Lissa bought building materials during the days of Jaime's disappearance. After the party's arguments, the prosecutor's office requested a new trial in April 2022. At that trial, an additional charge of extortion was filed. Lissa called Jaime's relatives, claiming he was being held by a group of gangsters and demanded $8,000 for his release. The defense relied on the lack of conclusive evidence that Lissa was involved in Jaime's murder. Nevertheless, she was found guilty and received a 22-year prison sentence, as well as a sentence to pay $5,000 to the victim's mother. While Jaime's trial was underway, the investigation of Marc Escanto and Jose Luis Arazo, Lisa's alleged victims, was nearing completion. Marc Escanto was 48 years old, and tests conducted after his death revealed traces of the same substance that Lisa had given to her children. In addition, Mark was found to have severe inflammation of the stomach. The family's lawyer claimed that Lissa met Mark, offered him a beer, and then put the poison in the drink. A glass with Lissa and Mark's fingerprints, as well as a swab containing the woman's DNA, was provided to authorities. Alleged motives for the murder included jealousy and money. It is also known that Lissa had asked Mark to help her financially, and there is evidence that he loaned her at least $120.00. Mark was Lissa's first known victim. The final outcome of this case, as well as that of Jose Luis Arazo, remain unknown. They may not have been reported in the press, or the investigation may not yet have reached the stage of being formally charged and brought to trial. At the time of her brutal crimes, Lisa Maria was only 26 years old. 
Her high-profile criminal case has become one of the most horrific and disturbing in Ecuador's recent history. These crimes made her known throughout the country as Doña Venado. Lisa Maria Kaisi is recognized as a serial killer in Ecuador. Her victims have endured terrible suffering, and their relatives have suffered unbearable pain. The charges include five murders and nine attempted murders. Under Ecuadorian law, the maximum sentence she could face is 40 years in prison. That means Lisa could be released when she turns 70 years old. It is still unclear what motivated Doña Venado to commit such horrific acts. Was her act the result of resentment for not getting what she expected in life? Many speculate that the motive was money. And in David's case, Lissa acted out of a lust for revenge, which led to the tragedy with her children. The most horrific part of this story is not only the number of victims left in the path of Doña Venado, but also the fate of two innocent children who could not have guessed that their mother, who gave them life, would take it away so absurdly and cruelly. Known as the Heart of the Bay, Hayward, California is the central point to other cities in the East Bay Area. Its residents are described as having a lot of love and community spirit, and its suburban vibe makes it an ideal place to live for families. With the second most diverse population in California, Hayward is as welcoming as its people. Hayward is home to the beautiful Cal State University. And in 1988, Michaela Garrick and her family called it home. Nine-year-old Michaela Joy Garrick was called a miracle child by her parents Susan Murch and Rod Garrick. For five years, Susan and Rod turned to doctors and fertility treatments before finally welcoming their beautiful daughter into the world. Michaela was born on January 24, 1979, in Oakland, California. Although it was a struggle to conceive Michaela, her parents called her their blessing. As soon after her birth, they welcomed another daughter, Libby, and a son, Alex. In 1986, they made the move to Hayward, where they decided to set down roots and raise their growing family. Michaela was described as a bright and lively child. She was well-behaved and listened to everything her parents told her. Sharing was described as a very caring mother, sometimes considered overprotective. She'd made sure her children were always kept close to home and under no circumstances wandered far without adult supervision. No one could blame her though. The 1980s saw an increase in child abductions, particularly in the California area. It was a Saturday morning, November 19, 1988, and Michaela had just finished eating breakfast with her family. When her best friend, nine-year-old Katrina Rodriguez, came over to ask Sharon if she and Michaela could go down to the local grocery store to buy snacks, the response was initially a firm no. Upset but not deterred, Michaela begged and pleaded with her mother, promising they'd be safe and come back quickly. Knowing her little girl was going to grow up sooner or later, Sharon relented and allowed them to go while reminding them to be careful. She gave Michaela $5 and the girls excitedly grabbed their scooters. Michaela turned to Sharon and said, I love you, mom. Before they made their way down the block and out of sight, uh, Sharon watched them go. Her husband, Rod, decided to go out and do some work on the car while Sharon went back in to clear up the breakfast dishes, unaware that in the next few minutes, her life was going to change forever. Michaela and Katrina excitedly rode their scooters toward the Rainbow Market on Mission Boulevard. Parking their scooters just in front of the store, both girls make their way inside to buy some snacks. After buying two Mountain Dew sodas, two sticks of beef jerky, and two pieces of cherry taffy, they walked out of the store, completely forgetting about their scooters as they chatted about plans for the holiday. Before they could leave the parking lot, though, both girls realized their scooters were still outside the store. One was missing, and Michaela and Katrina decided to split up to find the other scooter. Michaela spotted it first. It had been moved about three parking spaces away and left next to a car. Without thinking, Michaela ran over to the scooter and bent down to grab hold of the handlebars. In a split second, a man had jumped out of the car and grabbed Michaela around the waist before shoving her into the back seat. Like a deer in the headlights, Petrina stood frozen to the spot as she heard her friend's screams and watched her struggle in the abductor's grip. The man peeled out of the parking space before speeding out on Mission Boulevard heading toward Union City. 
Katrina immediately ran back into the store and told the cashier, Rona Ronalyn, that Michaela had just been kidnapped. Rona called the local police, who arrived in record time to the crime scene. She also contacted Katrina's father and told them what just happened at the store. Back at their home, Sharon was busy washing up the dishes when she heard frantic shouting from the outside. Rod, her husband, burst through the front door, telling her Michaela had just been kidnapped outside the Rainbow Market. Along with Katrina's father, they made their way down to the store to find police swarming the area and speaking to customers and staff from the store. Katrina was inconsolable and was allowed to go back home with her father. Rod and Sharon remained behind, hoping to get some answers. But from deep within, a seed of fear took root as Sharon remembered a poem Michaela had written. Sharon remembered an unsettling incident just a week earlier. She'd woken up to find Michaela sitting at the breakfast table, writing in the early hours of the morning. When she asked her what she was doing, Michaela told her mother she was writing a poem, but was being vague. Sharon kept asking her what the poem was about, and Michaela said she woke up after hearing noises coming from the attic and thought about people who had been kidnapped and locked away in the attic. She then told Sharon that her poem was about people who were kidnapped and being held captive, not people who were kidnapped and killed. Sharon at the time found it rather ominous that a child as cheerful as Michaela would write a poem like this. Looking back now, she believed Michaela may have written the poem as a kind of prophecy or a premonition. Rona, the cashier, was fortunately able to remember the man who allegedly took Michaela. She described him to police as a white male in his 30s with a mustache. She was able to make up the color of the car as being either burgundy or maroon, but could not give them details about the maker model. Rona told police that the man had parked his car and got out, but not entered the store. Instead, he looked on the outside and looked through the window, watching the girls and other customers. She also had a feeling he was planning on possibly robbing the store. A sketch artist quickly drew a composite sketch and circulated the picture to all police stations in the area and news outlets. Investigators found the scooter and took it in as evidence. From the scooter handle, they were able to lift a latent handprint. The print was filed away to be used to identify the kidnapper, but beyond that, there were few clues they could follow up on. By the end of the first day after the abduction, the Federal Bureau of Investigation joined the investigation into Michaela's abduction. Given the recent spate of child abductions, the FBI were sure there must have been some link between Michaela's disappearance and that of the other missing children. However, police soon realized that Katrina may be able to give a bit more information on the suspect as she was the key eyewitness to the abduction. Two days after the incident, investigators paid a visit to Katrina's family home and together with her parents, sat down and spoke to her. What she revealed had investigators reeling. The description of the kidnapper was drastically different to the one given by the store cashier. Katrina described the man as being a white male in his early 20s with long, dirty blonde hair. She said he had severe acne that scarred his face and described his eyes as being blue. Katrina remembered his eyes in particular and said to investigators, he had fox eyes. He looked right at me, but didn't even see me. She also told investigators that his car had been either beige or tan, box-shaped with visible body damage. This new description was concerning as investigators realized the most crucial 48 hours had passed while they were looking for the wrong person. The posters were reprinted with the new suspect's image and redistributed in hopes of being able to garner new leads. With the new information though, Investigators now began knocking on the doors of all sex offenders in the local area, asking questions. Volunteers came out in their numbers, knocking on doors and handing out posters that included a description of Michaela's clothes, white t-shirt with the word Metro written across it, rolled up blue denim jeans, black Mary Jane shoes, and pearl-colored feather shoot earrings. When no one reported any signs of Michaela anywhere in the nearby suburbs, police extended the search to include McGarren National Park and Niles Canyon that were just minutes from the Garrick family home. The search began following a tip from three hikers who allegedly saw footprints in the forested area belonging to one adult and one child. After they'd followed the tracks, they found a blanket and empty fast food containers. 
The psychological profile also pointed out that the kidnapper was likely to take Michaela to an isolated area. Helicopters were fitted with infrared thermal cameras to pick up any signs of a heat signature within the dense wooded areas. Police officers searched on horseback and foot. All these efforts yielded no results. Michaela had vanished along with her kidnapper into thin air. Michaela's disappearance reached the national news. Her story was featured on Unsolved Mysteries and was one of the first child abductions to feature on America's Most Wanted. Her face was printed on milk cartons and the Missing Children's Program printed over 50 million mail-in cards to homes around the country with pictures of Michaela, a description of her clothes, and a composite sketch of the kidnappers. San Francisco 49ers quarterback Joe Montana came out in support of the Garrick family and made an appeal to the public to come forward with any information. A reward fund of $70,000 was posted during this time for any information regarding Michaela's whereabouts. Within the first year of her disappearance, police had received over 5,000 tips, most of which turned out to be rumors. But no one was ready to give up. Sharon herself followed leads, some stretching as far as Russia, but nothing yielded any results. It would take another four years before investigators received a new tip that they believed could be real. In that time, over 15,000 tips were received and police were clutching at each one, hoping it could shed light on the missing girl's case. Between 1991 and 1992, an inmate in Indiana came forward with information regarding Michaela's disappearance. Roger Haggard, who was serving an 11-year sentence for a burglary charge, alleged that he helped a friend bury her body in a gladiolus field in Union City. However, investigators were not initially interested, believing it could have been a wild goose chase. When Haggard realized the investigators were not taking his claim seriously, he instead turned to the media. He wrote a letter in 1992 to the San Francisco Chronicle claiming to know who kidnapped Michaela and where she'd been buried. He promised to lead investigators to her body. The media attention and public outcry forced investigators to fly Hager to California in order to testify in front of a grand jury. Under oath, Haggard repeated the claims he'd been making to investigators. Haggard promised to lead investigators not only to Michaela's remains, but to the home of the alleged killer. The next day, Haggard, along with a team of investigators, searched the field that he claimed Michaela's body had been buried in. In a shocking twist, after eight hours of intense searching, Haggard allegedly told police that he'd made a false claim after all. He told investigators that he allegedly wanted to give the Garrett family a sense of peace after all these years. Haggard was charged with perjury and sentenced to another six years in prison in order to pay Michaela's family $6,000 in damages for giving them false hope. Each new lead was about to take investigators down a darker path than they'd imagined. Another person of interest had long been on police radar in 1991. Timothy Binder was a 43-year-old sewage treatment plant worker. He was married with a family, but investigators were tipped off by parents in the East Bay area about Binder's creepy behavior. Pence alleged that he'd been sending young girls gifts and money in order to get closer to them. Some of the letters were reportedly written backwards and could only be read by using a mirror. Investigators looked at the Binder's background and discovered that Binder drove a light blue van with a license plate that read, Love You. The inside of his van was allegedly covered with pictures of little children, crayon drawings, and Bible verses. According to reports, he'd been arrested for attempting to lure two young girls into his van, but the charges were dropped. Binder, investigators discovered, had a knack for inserting himself into the cases surrounding missing children. He had made contact with Michaela's mother, Sharon, following her disappearance in November of 1988. Prior to that, he had also made contact with Kim Schwartz, the mother of seven-year-old Amber Schwartz, who'd gone missing in June of the same year. Both mothers reportedly told police they did not have a good feeling about Binder and that he persisted in contacting them regarding the developments in both cases. In an eerie coincidence, Binder had written a letter to the police after Amber had disappeared. In the letter, he claimed that the next child to go missing would be a nine-year-old girl. And weirdly enough, Michaela was the next child reported missing. 
In early December, Binder also sent a Christmas card to an FBI profiler with a picture of a girl holding up four fingers. On December 27, 1991, Amanda Campbell, who was aged four, went missing from her home in Fairfield. Binder was also linked to the disappearance of 13-year-old Eileen Michelhoff from Dublin in California. In the trend of events, his generally strange behavior and interest in these cases started to garner him media attention. His name had become synonymous with the recent speed of child abductions, and people turned against him. Binder and his family were being harassed by the public who wanted answers for all the kidnappings. He eventually sued the city of Fairfield for defamation and won the case. Investigators eventually eased off on Binder with many of the opinion that all he wanted to do was play an important role in the investigation. Beneath all the mysteries, the case continued to captivate the public and challenge the investigators. Christine Anderson had also come under scrutiny following his capture and arrest in August of 2000. Following his arrest, Anderson admitted to the abduction and murder of seven-year-old Ziana Fairchild from Vallejo, California in 1999. In a 2007 interview with the FBI, Anderson claimed to have killed another 13 women and girls. He also alleged to have abducted and murdered seven-year-old Amber Swartz, who he saw standing on a street corner. Before he could provide investigators with more information, though, he died on December 9, 2007, from kidney and liver failure. Investigators looked into Anderson's background after his confession about killing multiple girls in his past. Records show that Anderson was pulled over in 1989 while driving a brown 1977 Chevy sedan that matched the vehicle description given by Katrina as well. However, his death left investigators unable to probe that line of investigation. Hope wasn't lost, though. The renewed effort of investigators brought Michaela's kidnapping back into the spotlight, and with it, more attention and new leads. Another twist comes in August 2012. Wesley Shermantine, who was one half of the murderous duo known as the Speed Freaks, contacted the Stockton Record following the suicide of his partner in crime, Lauren Herzog, in January of that year. He pointed out that Herzog bore a striking resemblance to the composite of the suspect in the Kalis case. This was strengthened by Katrina's comments that Herzog had features that looked very much like the man who kidnapped Michaela. At the direction of Shermantine, investigators began digging up a well in Linden, California, where the duo allegedly disposed of their victims. Thousands of bone fragments were discovered, some of which were believed to belong to Michaela. While the investigators never left hope of solving the case, the mystery kept baffling them further. Eight more years would pass before investigators could find a promising lead. The events that took place during this crime were truly shocking and left a lasting impact on the public. But the real shocker was yet to come. On December 21, 2020, the Haywood Police Department and FBI announced that they'd made an arrest in the case of Michaela Garrett. David Mish, who was 61 years old as of 2022, was charged with the kidnapping and murder of Michaela after his fingerprints were linked, using new technology, to those lifted from the scooter in 1988. We can announce that 59-year-old David Nish had been charged with the murder of Michaela Garrett. He is in custody at Santa Rita Jail here at Alameda County. A look into Mish's background painted a shocking picture of a man who escaped justice for far too long. David Emery Mish was born on February the 19th, 1961, in Chicago, Illinois. Not much is known about his life growing up, but by the time he was 16, he had already begun his life of crime. In 1977, Mish was convicted of breaking and entering a property and sexually assaulting a maid at knife point. He was arrested, but was paroled only a year later in 1978. In February 1979, he was arrested on charges of false imprisonment and assault with a deadly weapon. Those charges were later updated to assault with intent to rape. Once again, he would qualify for parole in September 1981, May 1988. He was arrested for burglary at a San Leandro grocery store and sentenced to one year in prison and one year probation. He was, however, released six months later in November of the same year. Karma finally caught up with them in December 1988. 
38-year-old Margaret Ball was a longtime friend of Mish who often helped him out in a tough spot. It's not certain what transpired between the two, but Margaret was discovered by her stepdaughter beaten and stabbed to death in a pool of blood. The beating was so severe that her front tooth was found a few feet away from her body. Police were alerted to Mish as the suspect as they would later find evidence linking him to the crime. He was arrested and convicted of Margaret's murder. He was sentenced to 18 years to life. In 2018, while he was still incarcerated for Margaret Ball's murder, DNA evidence linked Mish to another double homicide in Fremont, California in 1986. 18-year-old Michelle Xavier and her best friend, 20-year-old Jennifer Dewey, went there to celebrate a birthday dinner of a family member on February 2, 1986. After leaving the restaurant, the young women drove to a convenience store before going home. Shortly after midnight, though, a motorcyclist found both women's bodies on the side of the road. They were stripped naked, and they'd been stabbed and shot. Later, an autopsy revealed that they were also sexually assaulted. Michelle's car was found six miles from the crime scene in the parking lot of a grocery store. The case was highly publicized, and rewards were offered, but over the years, all leads and tips would thistle out, and the case went cold. 32 years later, DNA technology would lead detectives to David Mish. David Mish was charged with another three counts of murder and one for abduction as he serves out his current sentence. Alameda District Attorney Nancy O'Malley said that Mish had been charged with murder and two special circumstances. If found guilty, he could be given a death sentence. Haywood Police Chief Tony Chaplin said the disappearance of Michaela Garrick was a tragic story that gripped the Bay Area for decades. He said they were not going to stop the search for Michaela's body and remains hopeful that they'll find her. Michaela's father, Rod Garrick, drove over a hundred miles to attend the press conference. Rod said he finds some relief knowing Mish has been identified after all these years. I'm kind of relieved that they caught someone over it, so now I don't got a... They've got a suspect they can grill, and hopefully he'll cuff up wherever the body is, he said. Sharing, who'd been diagnosed with metastatic cancer back in 2019, was unable to attend the press conference. Police Chief Tony Chaplin read a statement on her behalf. In the last year, I had to come to a place of acceptance that Michaela was probably no longer alive. But somehow, that acceptance was far more wrapped up in the idea of Michaela sitting on a fluffy thin cloud walking on streets of gold, dancing on grassy hills, soaring among the stars. What I did not envision was my daughter as a dead child. It was only when I heard this news that this vision of reality appeared, and I've honestly not figured out what to do with it. Mish's attorney, Ernie Castillo, has been outspoken about the case involving his client. He blasted the investigation calling the methods used to charge Mish as junk science. He said that the sudden match of the handprint after 32 years just seemed ridiculous. Castillo insists that the police are trying to pin all the blame on Mish as an easy way to close the case. Now a middle-aged woman, Petrina Rodriguez, who married and moved away from Hayward to Texas, still harbors guilt over what happened that fateful Saturday morning. In her mind, it was meant to be her because the scooter that was moved belonged to Katrina. This burden of guilt has driven Katrina to forget her childhood. For sharing, she dedicated her entire life to finding Michaela. First, she waited at the door of the telephone, and as the years passed, she turned to the internet, searching. Sharon eventually started a blog called Dear Michaela. Later, she changed it to Seeker's Road. Sharon was eventually diagnosed with cancer, and after Mish was charged with Michaela's murder, the fight slowly faded out of her. She knew she would see her daughter soon. Sharon passed away in May 2022. There was one last twist to come in this already puzzling case. As David Mish awaits trial on the charges of kidnapping and murder in the case of Michaela Garrett and the murders of Michelle Xavier and Jennifer Dewey, New Alameda County District Attorney Pamela Price created a ripple among those who had been invested in seeing David Mish pay for his crimes. Christ is drawing criticism after making the decision to drop all special circumstances in the three killings. If convicted of all three counts of murder, Mish no longer faces life in prison without parole or the death penalty. 
After waiting three decades to see Mish pay for his crimes, family, friends, and supporters from Michaela might have to face the reality that Mish could get away with his crimes without facing the appropriate justice. Child safety advocate Michael Klaas, who's the father of Polly Klaas, who was abducted and killed in 1993, said it was a complete and utter betrayal. Mish's defense attorney, Evie Castillo, welcomed the news. Each case relies heavily on questionable forensic tactics. Price's decision doesn't surprise me. In fact, it acknowledges the weakness in the case, he said. Retired Fremont Lieutenant Chuck Uller, who worked on the 1986 Michel Xavier and Jaffer Dewey murders, for which Mish has also been charged, said, I think there's exceptions to every rule, and if anybody ever deserved maximum punishment, it's David Mish. A former prosecutor and KTVU legal analyst called the move reckless and said it was not a good idea to take any kind of punishment off the table from the get-go. As Michaela's body has still not been found, it could be a bargaining chip for later. This is the poster case for putting someone in prison forever to keep them away from society. David Mish awaits trial on three charges of murder and one of kidnapping. The case of Michaela Garrett has been a story filled with twists and turns that began with a case of mistaken identity that cost law enforcement the first crucial 48 hours of the investigation. It kept a family grasping at straws for decades. And now it may give an alleged killer the opportunity to deny any involvement and keep the truth of a little girl's body's whereabouts a mystery. What do you think of the case? Hello friends, welcome to our channel. Today we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. As the police started their search, they encountered a series of unexpected twists that no one could have predicted. Eventually, the detectives managed to uncover the truth about the girl's fate, but no one was ready for it. Rowan Ford was born on April 11, 1998, in San Diego, California. Her parents divorced when she was young, and her mother, Colleen, moved with her to a small town called Stella in Missouri. Later, her mom met a man named David, and they got married. Colleen had several children from a previous marriage, and soon after their wedding, she and David had a daughter together. Altogether, Rowan had two sisters and two brothers, and they shared a very close bond. She spent a lot of time outdoors, riding her bike around town, enjoying swimming, and indulging in her passion for drawing. She also liked going to Sunday school at the local church, where she always volunteered to help other kids who had some issues with their tasks. In November 2007, when Rowan was nine years old and in the fourth grade at the local elementary school, her mom worked the night shift at a store while her stepdad spent most of the day on the farm. This left Rowan often fending for herself, which made her very independent. On November 2nd, she stayed home alone as usual. Her mom went to work and her stepdad hadn't returned from the farm yet. The next morning around 9 a.m., Colleen came home from her night shift and checked Rowan's room, but her daughter wasn't there. She asked her husband where her daughter was. He said she had asked him if she could have a sleepover at a friend's house, and he had let her go. He didn't even ask the friend's name because their town was very small and he wasn't worried about anything happening to her. But Colleen started to worry and decided to check with all of Rowan's friends. Since there were only a few streets in their town, it didn't take long, but none of them had seen her, and she hadn't stayed over at any of their houses, which made her mother even more concerned. Colleen searched the whole town but couldn't find her daughter. She went back home and told her husband that Rowan was nowhere to be found. She asked him to call the police and report her missing, but he reassured her that everything was fine and that she would come home soon. After waiting for several more hours with no sign of Rowan, Colleen took matters into her own hands and dialed 911 herself. The local sheriff immediately organized a search operation. He went to their house to speak with David, as he was the last person to see Rowan before she disappeared. David said that on that evening, while he was working on the farm with his colleague Christopher, their mutual friend Nathan came by. They all decided to go to David's place to have some drinks and play pool. 
They stopped by the store, bought some alcohol, and went to David's house, where they spent several hours. Later in the night, Christopher asked Nathan to drive him home to the neighboring town where his trailer was, and they persuaded David to join them to continue the fun. Before leaving the house, he checked on Rowan in her room, seeing that she was asleep. David left with his friends, stopped by the store again, grabbed more alcohol, and headed to Christopher's trailer, where they continued drinking for about an hour. After that, David decided to head home and ask Nathan to give him a ride. Nathan agreed, but chose to take back roads instead of the main highway. By that time, he was quite drunk and didn't want to risk encountering the police. Nathan dropped him off and drove home, while David went straight to bed. Soon after, he was awakened by Rowan, who asked if she could sleep over at a friend's house. Without much thought, he agreed and fell back asleep. Police approached this story with some skepticism. What puzzled them most was the fact that a nine-year-old girl decided to go to her friend's house in the middle of the night, and her stepfather let her go without even asking which friend she was talking about. The sheriff considered that David might be hiding something or directly involved in Rowan's disappearance, but he had no evidence to support this theory. Police searched the town and its surroundings until late at night. Local residents immediately joined the search, as they all knew Rowan's family and wanted to help. The population of Stella was only about 150 people, so news of her disappearance spread throughout the county almost instantly. People were used to being able to let their children play outside without a worry, as nothing ever happened in such a quiet place. But now, Rowan had vanished without a trace, and the police were unable to find her. For a whole day, the residents of Stella were in a state of panic. The first day of the search yielded no results. On November 4th, the police went to the neighboring town to speak with Christopher, who fully corroborated David's story. However, Christopher added that his friend hadn't even contacted him since that evening, and he had only just found out about Rowan's disappearance on the same day. The police expanded the search and involved even more volunteers, but they still couldn't find Rowan or any clues to her whereabouts. The next morning, the FBI joined the investigation while the local police continued to search for Rowan throughout the town and its surroundings. Detectives focused on exploring the possibility of abduction. They strongly doubted the stepfather's story, as it seemed highly questionable. Police also checked with all of Rowan's friends and confirmed that she hadn't visited any of them that night. Investigators continued to speak with David, and he changed certain details in his story several times, further raising suspicions against him. For instance, he gave conflicting timelines for his absence from home that night, and even said that perhaps Rowan hadn't asked him for permission to go to her friend's house and just left without his knowledge. FBI agents also discovered that on the night of her disappearance, David had asked his mother to borrow her car, a fact he had initially not disclosed to the police. As a result, they decided to seize both this car and his own pickup truck for examination, but experts were unable to uncover any evidence. Meanwhile, detectives decided to speak with Christopher and Nathan again, as they were both with David that evening. Police invited Christopher to the station, he repeated the same story as the day before. He also agreed to a polygraph test, which showed no signs of deception. Several hours after Christopher left the station and returned to work, he noticed Sheriff Clark's car and waved for him to stop. Sheriff Clark led the police department in their town called Witten and had known Christopher for 17 years since his childhood. The sheriff was friends with his foster parents and Christopher always respected him he often sought his advice or help in difficult times, such as when his mother passed away. Sheriff Clark approached Christopher, and they discussed Rowan's disappearance. The sheriff was aware of the case, but had not been involved in it, as the search was being handled by the Stella Department. During their conversation, the sheriff felt that Christopher's behavior was quite weird, and he suspected that Christopher might be withholding some information from him. Considering that Rowan's life was at stake and her fate remained unknown, 
Clark decided to share his suspicions with the FBI. He contacted the agents and told them about his concerns. Investigators assumed that Christopher might be withholding some significant information that could implicate Rowan's stepfather in her disappearance. Perhaps he had asked Christopher to lie and change certain details in the story of that evening, and now Christopher feared being implicated as an accomplice if he told the truth. Sheriff Clark informed the FBI agents that he had a close and trusting relationship with Christopher, so he offered to help persuade him to talk. That same evening, Christopher went to Colleen's house to ask her if there was any progress in the search. About the same time, FBI agents also arrived to speak with Rowan's mother again. When they saw Christopher there, they also asked him some questions, and he once again repeated that the events of that evening unfolded exactly as he had previously said. But then he mentioned for the first time that he did not rule out the possibility of David's involvement in her disappearance and said that he wanted to help them uncover the truth, no matter how terrible it might be. He even suggested wearing a wire and going to talk to David to try to coax him into confessing. But at that point, the detectives decided not to resort to such tactics. Instead, they asked Christopher if he had any locations in mind where his friend could have hidden Rowan's body, and he named several places. The next morning, police set out to search these locations as well as continuing their search in the surrounding areas of Stella. FBI agents once again brought David for questioning, but he repeatedly denied any involvement. Detectives searched his home in an attempt to find any leads, but it turned up nothing. Meanwhile, Christopher went to the sheriff's office to speak with Clark and told him about his encounter with the FBI. During their conversation, the sheriff had a strong feeling that Christopher was still withholding something. After their meeting, he contacted the detectives again and told them that Christopher might be keeping some information that could likely help them prove David's involvement. FBI agents asked the sheriff to continue trying to persuade him to talk, based on the fact that Christopher had repeatedly contacted Clark to discuss the case with him. They believed he wanted to share important information, but for some reason, he was afraid to do so. The next day, on November 7th, the police called Christopher back to the station. They needed his consent to search his safe located in David's house. Christopher had been living with him for several months when he temporarily didn't have a place of his own, and some of his belongings were still there. Christopher gave them his permission and also agreed to allow the police to search his trailer and his car. He also voluntarily provided them with a DNA sample and agreed to answer the detective's questions again. They began questioning him about that evening and once again asked him to confirm David's story. But this time, Christopher suddenly admitted that his friend's story wasn't entirely true. The investigators began pressing him to tell them what really happened, but this pressure only caused Christopher to become agitated. He said that if the police were going to treat him like a criminal and attempt to accuse him of involvement in Rowan's disappearance, he would not continue this conversation. After that, detectives had to end the interrogation and Christopher left the station. That same evening, he went to Sheriff Clark and told him about it. He complained that the detectives were treating him like a suspect and said that he might need to hire a lawyer. The sheriff replied that it was his right but asked him to understand that the police were just doing everything possible to find Rowan. In response, Christopher stated that he would no longer speak with them and that if he wanted to share anything else, he would only speak with Clark. The sheriff continued to persuade Christopher to tell him everything he knew, and at some point, Christopher began to cry. He said that he always loved Rowan and would never harm her. During the time when he lived in David's house, he developed a close bond with Rowan and the other children. They began to treat him like a family member and even called him Uncle Christopher. The sheriff understood that Christopher was on the brink of revealing everything he knew. However, just as Christopher was about to speak, someone arrived at the police station, distracting Sheriff Clark for some time. Christopher left the office without sharing what he had intended to. 
Sheriff Clark reached out to the FBI again and told them about this conversation. He explained that Christopher was almost ready to disclose everything he knew, but cautioned that pushing him too hard might cause him to stop talking and get an attorney. Clark suggested giving Christopher some time to think it over, and the detectives agreed. The search for Rowan continued the next day, again with no luck, but everything changed on November 9th, a week after her disappearance. Search groups reached a remote area near a town called Powell, 10 miles from Stella. There, amidst fields and trees, they discovered a large pit in the ground. When they looked there, they found Rowan's body concealed under leaves and debris. She was missing all clothing below the waist, except for one sock. Medical experts found signs of strangulation and also determined that she had been sexually assaulted. Shortly after the body's discovery, FBI agents contacted Sheriff Clark and asked him to speak with Christopher again, hoping he would now reveal everything. Sheriff learned that earlier that morning, Christopher had visited the station when he wasn't there and informed other officers that he needed to speak urgently with Clark. The sheriff set out to search for Christopher, checking all the places where he might be, but the man was nowhere to be found. It continued until Christopher called Clark himself. He was clearly distressed and asked if he was being followed. He explained that after hearing the news about Rowan's body being found, he drove around town to clear his head and noticed a gray car tailing him. Sheriff Clark replied that he knew nothing about any surveillance and suggested meeting Christopher in person. When they met, Christopher was visibly nervous and expressed concern for his safety. He feared that after Rowan's body was discovered, he might be accused of murder and someone might seek revenge against him. Clark took him to the station and said that now that the case had been classified as a homicide, it was time to reveal everything he knew. Christopher began crying again, and the sheriff asked him to tell what David had done to Rowan. In response, Christopher stated that there were too many people at the police station and he didn't want to discuss it there. He suggested going to a quieter place and mentioned a small bridge located a few miles from their town. Clark agreed and they drove there together. As they got out of the car, Christopher unexpectedly raised his hands and said that the sheriff should handcuff him. The sheriff was surprised and replied that it wasn't necessary, but Christopher insisted, saying, After what I tell you, you'll have to do it. After this, he began talking. Christopher repeated the first part of the story he had told the police many times. He, along with Nathan and David, went to his trailer, where they continued drinking. Sometime later, his friends decided to head home and David asked Nathan for a ride. They said they would take back roads to avoid the police and left. But then Christopher started telling something that shocked the sheriff to the core. He claimed that he wanted to sexually assault Rowan and quickly came up with a plan. Knowing his friends would take quite some time on the road through the fields, he got into his car and drove straight to David's house, taking the main highway. He entered Rowan's room, picked her up, and carried her to his car, doing it all so that she wouldn't wake up. After that, he took her to his trailer where he assaulted her. According to him, she only woke up at that moment and tried to resist, but she couldn't break free. Christopher didn't turn on the lights or speak to her because he didn't want Rowan to recognize him. After the crime, he planned to take her back home and leave, but things didn't go as planned. When he carried Rowan out of the trailer, the moon was shining brightly and she saw his face. Christopher panicked, grabbed a rope and strangled her. When she passed away, he loaded her body into the car and started thinking about what to do next. At first, he wanted to dump her from the bridge, the same one where he stood with Sheriff Clark, but Christopher realized that her body would be found too quickly. So he got behind the wheel and began driving around the county, considering other options. Soon, he remembered the large pit near the neighboring town and headed there. He dumped the body into the pit and tried to cover it with branches, but the pit was too large, so everything fell down. When he returned to the trailer, he found traces of Rowan's blood on his clothes and mattress. Christopher also realized he needed to get rid of her pants, 
underwear and the rope he used to kill her. He collected all these items and placed them in a large barrel, intending to burn them. However, Christopher quickly realized that such a fire would definitely attract attention, so he dragged the barrel into the shed, closed the door, and started the fire there. Sheriff Clark was completely taken aback by this story. All this time, he thought David had committed the crime and Christopher was just withholding some information. It was hard for him to believe that the man he had known for almost 20 years was capable of such brutality. Christopher himself had three young children, and although he didn't live with them after divorcing his wife, he always seemed like a decent man to him. But reality turned out to be way more chilling. After Christopher finished his story, he agreed to voluntarily go to the station, and the sheriff didn't handcuff him. Only after they arrived and the man repeated his confession to the FBI agents, he was arrested on charges of murder. Christopher also signed a voluntary consent to search his trailer and car. Ending his confession, he added that he regretted his actions and said that he cried like a baby all the next day. The detectives immediately went to speak with David and informed him that Christopher had confessed to the murder. Considering David's strange behavior and inconsistent statements, they suspected that he might have been covering for his friend. However, they were met with an even more shocking twist. When David was brought in for questioning, he suddenly changed his version of events. According to him, the night he returned home and found Rowan missing from her room, he realized that Christopher might have taken her. So, he took his mother's car and drove to his trailer. Upon entering, he saw the girl on the bed with Christopher leaning over her. Instead of rescuing Rowan, David decided to join in. He also sexually assaulted her. Then he helped his friend kill her and dispose of the body. David added that during the ordeal, his brain simply shut off, and he remembered nothing about the night for several days. The detectives, who were not expecting such a twist, went back to Christopher to confirm David's words. However, Christopher stated that his friend was not involved and that everything happened as he had told them. This further baffled the detectives, but Christopher's story matched the facts. Medical experts confirmed that the victim had been strangled with a thin rope, a detail only the killer would know. During a search of the trailer, the police found a barrel with ashes. In his car, they also discovered hair comparable to Rowan's. Despite investigators still being unable to confidently determine whose version of events was truthful, both men provided incriminating statements. So David was also arrested and the cases were sent to court. During the trial, Christopher filed a motion to exclude all his statements from the case materials, claiming he was unaware they could be used against him and that the police violated his rights. But the judge denied this motion since all his conversations with investigators were entirely voluntary. Christopher also attempted to plead mitigating circumstances, pointing out his difficult childhood. From an early age, he was constantly shuffled between biological and foster parents, which greatly impacted him. Christopher also invited an expert who claimed he had signs of developmental issues, but none of this helped him avoid punishment. In 2012, Five years after the murder, he was sentenced to death. He tried to appeal this sentence, but to no avail. As for David, the situation was much more complicated. He admitted to assaulting and killing Rowan, but there was one serious problem. His version contradicted Christopher's statements. If the prosecution decided to charge David with murder, it could potentially lead to Christopher's sentence being overturned, and David might also avoid responsibility. Considering there was no solid evidence against David, such as DNA, the prosecution could not take such a risk. In fact, they still weren't sure if he was involved at all. The prosecution did not rule out the possibility that David might have indeed committed the crime together with Christopher, but there was no evidence to support this theory. In the end, a difficult decision was made. To avoid the risk of Christopher's sentence being overturned, they reduced David's charges to much lighter ones. He pleaded guilty to two charges, child endangerment and obstruction of justice. He was sentenced to 11 years in prison with a minimum of five years to be served behind bars. 
This sentence was met with outrage. If David was indeed involved in the murder, his punishment was deemed incomparable to the severity of the crime. However, there's nothing that can be done about it now, and it's unlikely that he will ever be tried again for this case. As for Christopher, he remains in prison awaiting execution. Considering that decades often pass between sentencing and execution, there are no guarantees that the death penalty will ever be carried out. It's quite possible that he will simply spend the rest of his life in prison.